Well, welcome to the Sunday morning service. This, I believe, is the 14th session of the lesson, The Eight Steps from Death to Life, which is the eighth lesson of the Foundations of Life Bible Study series. We're in the second section, which is the heart of the lesson. And uh, we uh, have been several weeks in it. We're going to continue with the eight steps from death to life. And we were talking last session about the importance of following the pattern that God has revealed or the order that God has given for how things are to be built. We know that God gave precise instructions concerning how to build the tabernacle and the various temples that were built in the Old Testament. We also are assured that God has given precise instructions to the church. As we investigate what the Word of the Lord says about these instructions, we are going to find out that faith is the very first necessity. Look at Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, a couple of things I want to point out to you from this passage. Without faith, there is no possibility, none whatsoever of pleasing God. So faith must come before any attempt, any effort to please God is going to be successful. The explanation for that is for he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Let's stop there and consider this. This doesn't say that you must have a, a, a belief that there is a God. That is not what it says. It says you must believe that the one who really is God is God. This involves knowing his person, his identity, and perhaps even his plan. If you don't know which God is God, at the very best, you're like those on Mars Hill who were lost and to whom Paul preached that they ignorantly worshiped the one who is God. And he was declaring the one who is God to them when he declared Jesus Christ. It is necessary for you to believe that he is. And I've already taught you that scripturally, believing God is knowing who he is and obeying what he commands you to do. You must believe that he is when you begin your journey toward him. So everything that comes before knowing him before coming to believe that he is all of that is preface none of it is a part of building the christian life and you not only must believe that he is but if you do know him and you do start obeying him you will know that he is indeed a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. It's not just seeking him as a pastime. It's not seeking him part-time. It's diligently seeking him. That means you do whatever needs to be done according to God's word to find him, to come to know him, to learn of him. Now, I want to take the rest of our time this morning to give you some method of defining faith. This is an unpopular part 
of the lesson. I can't help it. I struggled to find the right definition of faith after God told me what it was. I didn't like his definition, and I worked hard to prove it wrong. I couldn't prove it wrong. So I'm going to share it with you. And I'll begin by telling you what he told me, that Hebrews 11.1 1 describes faith, but it does not define faith. Let me show you. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. How does that help you know what faith is? Uh, do you have a grip on the idea of the substance of things hoped for? What about the evidence of things not seen? That describes faith, and I think it is a magnificent description of faith. It's beautiful, if you know what the words mean, and if you apply that understanding to your thinking. Faith is the substance it's not the hoped for. It's the substance, the tangible reality, the underlying fact of things hoped for. It is the evidence, the personal experiential knowledge of things not seen. That's a description of faith, and it's powerful. And I beg you, don't forget that it is not the hoped for or the things not seen. It is the substance and the evidence. Those are realities, not imaginations. Faith is substance and evidence. Faith is not the hope. Faith is not the unseen. Every one of the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 had only one thing in common. Oh yes, I know they were all human beings, and yes, they all had faith and, and all of that. They all got mentioned in the chapter, the, those things they all had in common. But when you examine their lives in the scripture, recording everything that the scripture says about them, there's only one thing they all had in common. And what that was, was each one of them knew which God really was God. Every one of them. And they had nothing else in common, all of them together. They all knew that Yahweh, the God of Israel, is in fact the only God. Romans 1, 1 through 5 specifically defines the gospel. I want you to notice this. If you ask a preacher uh, to define the gospel, they'll take you to 1 Corinthians, and that's fine, except for it doesn't define the gospel. But Romans 1 one through five does. Listen to it. Listen carefully. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Did you hear it? The gospel concerns the specific details 
about Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Son of God. And specifically that he was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. This is talking about God being manifested in flesh, the word becoming flesh. And he was declared to be the son of God with power, according to two things. The fact that he demonstrated holiness. His spirit was the spirit of holiness. And that was proven by the resurrection from the dead. It was not possible that death could hold him. He distributes grace and apostleship to us to empower us to demonstrate our knowledge of him among all nations. Second Peter chapter 1 verses 1 through 5 confirm that faith is our knowledge of God manifesting himself as a human being the man, Christ Jesus. Listen to these wonderful words. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. What's it tell us? Simon Peter is a servant of one master. No man can serve two masters. And Peter did not serve two persons or three persons in a Godhead, he served the one, Jesus Christ. Peter was a servant of Jesus Christ for the simple reason that Jesus Christ is God, manifested as a human being. He's writing to them that have obtained like precious faith with us. The verb to obtain means to have dealt to you by another, to obtain by lot, and simply accept what is given. This Greek verb is passive, while the verb to receive is active. The English verbs are the opposite, so this can be confusing to we English readers. They obtained faith. It was dealt to them by somebody else. They didn't attain it. They obtained it. They didn't reach it. It was given to them by another. And that's what that word means. The word like is significant as well. I need you to understand. You need to understand that the word like means the same. It does not mean similar. It means the same. I ask this question to make the point. Is this true or false? One equals one. Why? That's true. But what about this? Is it true or false that one apple equals one apple. No, that's not true. The reason is proven every time you go to the grocery or to the food stand and you pick up an apple to buy and you look at it and put it back and take a different one. Why? One apple's one apple. No, one is equal to one, but one of something is not equal to one of something unless they are the same one. And Peter said, we obtained like, meaning the same. It's the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Many times I've had people ask me when they discover or discern that I am a minister of the gospel. They say, well, what faith are you of? I say, the only one. For there is but one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. The 
faith we have obtained is precious. That word precious means of great value, of great importance, of great honor. To be precious, something must be rare. It must be necessary. And it must be desired. I give the example. Uh, oxygen is abundant. And hardly any of us spend much time thinking about it. But if you are three feet underwater and you're there for very long, all of a sudden that air is very precious to you. That oxygen becomes very precious to you. And you want to get where you can get more of it. It's rare. And you want to get more of it because you know you need it. It's necessary. And if you're down there long enough, you certainly desire it. This faith that we have obtained by God dropping it in our laps, by God giving it to us, is the same that was given to the apostles, and it is precious because it's not common. It's not insignificant. It's necessary, and we know that we need it. Now, faith, that's the subject we're defining, but we're going to define it at a later point in the study, some today perhaps. We obtain this like precious faith, Peter said, with us. That means together and under the authority of the apostles. That's what the phrase with us means. The us was the apostles, and the with them means that we were not only present, because not all of us were, but we are all under their authority. We obtain this like precious faith with them. Now, if you got a different faith than they had, you didn't obtain that, and you didn't obtain anything with them either. Now, he goes on and said that we receive, we obtain this like precious faith through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What that means? This faith was obtained through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Through, that means by the means of. For it's the righteousness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, which made it possible for us to obtain the faith. Made it possible for faith to be given to us, to be dropped in our laps. The righteousness, that's the container. That's the box in, by, and through which the faith was dealt to us. That's the package it came in when God dealt it to us. The righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What that means is not that there is a God and our Savior. It means that Jesus Christ is both God and our Savior. He is both the deity and the human Savior. God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, in other translations is translated a little better for we English readers, many of them translate it, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't know how clear it has to get before we figure out that we're being told that the one God is Jesus Christ and he is the Savior. These verses exclude all other theologies, the theology of Trinitarianism, of Mormonism, of Jehovah's Witnesses, of of Islam, of Hindus, and all other religions. They are excluded by this language. The Bible does not acknowledge the validity of any language, of any theology, <coughs> except this one theology, 
that the everlasting, almighty, transcendent God manifested himself in flesh as a human being. We know historically by the name Jesus Christ. We also know that biblically. And it is through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So as to sum it up, his righteousness was the means by which we are dealt faith. You want to know God? Take a good look at Jesus Christ. That's the only way to know God. Grace and peace, Peter went on to say. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Well, that means that grace and peace are multiplied to us through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. What does this mean? Grace and peace be multiplied. Well, I want you to understand that grace and peace were granted to all mankind through the life and death of Jesus Christ. But that did not result in all mankind being saved. What was the angelic host song? Peace and goodwill toward men. What did the Old Testament prophets and psalmists say when they talked about God coming as Savior? You know, the whole earth is full of his glory, peace and goodwill. You know, this is the salvation of mankind and all that. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, but it didn't save all men. The Bible has lots in it that tells about the losing of the soul, the lost souls, those that will be damned, condemned forever out of the presence of God. So grace and peace that were given to us through the knowledge of him does not save all men. We certainly need it multiplied unto us. And our salvation depends on the multiplying of grace and peace in our lives. And thank God we can get it because it is multiplied unto us through, that means there is a vessel, a vehicle, a container, a box, if you will, in, by, and through which grace and peace are multiplied unto us. That means it's not just laying out in the open to be grabbed. There's a, a container, a vehicle, through which grace and peace are multiplied unto us. If you don't have the box it's in, my friend, you don't have the product. The knowledge, knowledge, the, the, it's a singular word. It's a specific knowledge. It's not knowledge in general. It's not just knowing that the sky appears to be blue or that grass grows. It's specific knowledge. It's the knowledge. And what knowledge is that? It's that knowledge through which grace and peace are multiplied unto us. And it's specifically the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. God and of Jesus our Lord. That's the object of that singular knowledge. It's one truth, not two truths. It's one truth. The knowledge is never the knowledge of a them. So don't be thinking that the knowledge of God, comma, and of Jesus our Lord is the knowledge of two persons. It's not the knowledge of two persons. It's never the knowledge of a plurality. It's the knowledge of a him, not a them. Listen to it. Verse 3, the knowledge of him, not them. Verse 8, the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's not two persons. In chapter 2, verse 20, it's the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not two, just one. In chapter 3, 18, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord 
and Savior, Jesus Christ. So of God and of Jesus our Lord is a reference to the fact that this man, Jesus Christ, that we study is both the deity and the humanity. He is God. All you get as far as availability, as far as knowability, all that can be known of God is revealed in that humanity. He is both God and our Lord, our Savior, deity and humanity, one person, just as was expressed in 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. In chapter 1.1, 1, 1, the reference is to God and our Savior, deity and humanity, transcendence and manifestation, beyond comprehension, beyond reachability, beyond experience, and manifested, made knowable. In verse 2, the reference is to God, the deity, and of Jesus our Lord, that man who is our Savior. In verse 3, it's of God and of Jesus our Lord. That is not a reference to a him or to a them, but to a him. <clears throat> now that brings me to asking you a question. Why are grace and peace multiplied unto us through the knowledge of the deity and humanity of Jesus our Lord. Why is it not multiplied unto us through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which we are thankful to receive, or some other spiritual experience or spiritual phenomena? Why is it through this oneness knowledge, this knowing the oneness of God in Jesus Christ, why is it through that knowledge? Well, the answer is clearly stated in the following verses. And I want you to pay attention. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. <laughs> it's because God's divine power has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Not just the multiplication of grace and peace, but all things that pertain unto life and godliness are given to us, are handed to us, are made available to us through the knowledge that the everlasting almighty God manifested himself as the man, Christ Jesus, according as his, that his is a reference to God and of Jesus our Lord, a him, not a them. It proves that God and Jesus our Lord cannot possibly be two persons or three persons or any other number of persons, just the one. According as his divine power, grace and peace are multiplied in our lives through that knowledge by the direct action of God. It's not by our action, it's by his action. I'm telling you special students that this is a revelation, not a resource, a result of research, but a revelation that may complement and bring life to research. His divine power have given unto us, it's the direct action of God and his actions focus on providing the essential for us, the first essential for us to be saved. He 
all things that pertain to life and godliness, as you must understand, includes a whole lot more than just the multiplication of grace and peace. So why was it through this knowledge of the oneness of God in Jesus Christ that God chose to multiply grace and peace unto us? That's because his divine power gave us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through this very singular revelation of who Jesus really is. All things that pertain to life and godliness. This can be a little troubling to the sensibilities of many people. Everything, all things, everything that has to do with salvation and spiritual development, all things that pertain unto life and godliness, not just the coming to be, the, the life, but also the living the life. Everything that pertains to life and godliness is given to us through this singular knowledge that the deity became a man to reveal himself and to be our savior. The multiplication of grace and peace is one of the things, two of the things that pertain unto life and godliness. I have to say it, we will not be saved without the multiplication of grace and peace in our lives. And though multiplied through the knowledge of him, the knowledge of God into Jesus our Lord is not the knowledge of two persons, but the knowledge of only one. That one person, Jesus Christ, is both the deity and a human being. <clears throat> and knowing Jesus Christ as the only God and also a man is the vehicle through which God gives us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Now listen to this language. This is not my language. This is the scripture's language. Nothing that pertains unto life and godliness comes to us through any other vehicle. If it's all in this box, there's none of it in that box. If it's all in this knowledge, then none of it is in that knowledge. All things that pertain unto life and godliness are given unto us through the knowledge of him, the deity and humanity. Under, of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Well, who is the one who has called you to glory and virtue? He's the one that has dealt out faith to us and called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He gives us the knowledge of his deity and his humanity to enable us to become partakers of his glory and nature. That's what we're told in verse 4, whereby or by that same knowledge are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. I'm going to deal with this in another few moments if you're patient with me. That by these promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. This knowledge of the deity and the humanity of Jesus Christ contains the exceeding great and precious promises. Boy, this is that language, exceeding great and precious promises. We must call upon the exceeding great and precious promises of God in order to be saved. We don't have an ability to be saved otherwise. 
these promises are given unto us through the knowledge that Jesus Christ is both the deity and the human savior. Listen to the language, whereby are given unto us. Whereby are is a plural construction, which many say requires plural antecedents. A very few commentators suggest that the promises are given to us through the glory and virtue unto which he has called us. I got to tell you, those that believe that are wrong, purely wrong, altogether wrong, entirely wrong, and ignorant of the very scripture they claim to be expounding. There are a couple of reasons why I say that and say it unapologetically, although I love some people who happen to believe that. But here's why it can't be true. That contradicts the prior verse, which states that all things, all of them, plural, all things that pertain unto life and godliness are given to us through the knowledge of him. None of them are given to us through glory and virtue. They are all given to us through the knowledge of him. And any doctrine that contradicts a plain, unmistakable statement of scripture is wrong. Certainly, the exceeding great and precious promises are included in that all things. Now, the knowledge of him has been defined as having two components, the deity and humanity. I think it is a stretch to make those two components, the plural antecedents, that some claim are required by the Greek grammar. I think rather the exceeding great and precious promises are all indeed exceeding great and also precious. Okay. They're rare, they're necessary, they're desired. <clears throat> they're rare means not everybody has them. They're necessary, everyone needs them, and they're desirable. Who knows that they're needed? That by these, these exceeding great promises are part of the method of accomplishing God's role in our lives, God's purposes and goals for our life. Now listen, you notice that promises is plural. Whereby are given what? What's given? What requires the plural? The giver or the things that are given? You understand this. Whereby are given does not require plural antecedents. It requires plural things given. And the exceeding great and precious promises are plural. And all of them are given through the knowledge of the deity and humanity of Jesus Christ. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. It's using those promises. It is, that's what enables us to transcend our sinfulness. If you want to be a partaker of the divine nature, you will be transcending your own sinfulness. And these promises are obtained in the knowledge of the oneness of God in Jesus Christ. Calling on these promises gives us the potential to overcome the inherent degenerating nature we have because we are not God. God does not degenerate. Not God, whatever it is, degenerates because it's God and God alone who doesn't degenerate. The prophet said, even the heavens are going to roll up and vanish, but you will be the same. So we have to call on the promises because they give us the potential to overcome our degenerating nature and become a partaker of the nature of God.
That's what we were told when Peter said, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You hear it? You cannot become a partaker until you have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. It is necessary to escape our lustful corruption for us to become a partaker of the divine nature. So through the use of the promises that God gives us through his revelation, we can escape the corruption that afflicts all mankind through our own selfish desires. And we become partakers of the divine nature in the same measure that we escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. So here's the method. I, I already stated, I'm going to state it again, the method of how we become partakers of the divine nature. First, the one true God himself became flesh as Jesus Christ. As a man, Jesus Christ fulfilled all the will of God, living righteously, and living righteously happened to also require his sacrificial death. His righteousness as a man qualified him for the titles he's given in the scripture. It justified him and justified his creating something that got messed up and purchased redemption for his fallen creation. His righteousness enabled mankind generally and you and me individually to actually know that transcendent God. Through his self-revelation, he provided a plan of salvation and made it known unto us, knowing him enables us to call upon his promises that we may escape the corruption of the world through lust. And the more we escape that corruption that's in the world through lust, the more we experience his divine nature. And when he returns, we who have this wonderful revelation, we who know him in his deity and humanity shall be fully changed and become the fullness of him which filleth all in all. Somebody say praise the Lord with me. What a future we have in store. According to Ephesians 1.23, the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And all of this is given to us, is obtained. We obtain it through the knowledge of the deity and the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Say praise God. I'm going to start this, but not finish it in the next 15 minutes. 2 Peter 1.5 Verses 1 through 5 actually define faith very specifically. You have to read it. You have to let it sink down into your understanding. Listen to what Peter said in verse 5. And beside this, what's the this? What's the this? It's the subject of the first four verses. What is that subject? The knowledge of the deity and humanity of Jesus Christ, that he is the almighty God manifested in flesh as a human being. And besides this, this knowledge of the deity and humanity of Jesus Christ, besides this, giving all diligence add to your faith. I, I don't know how anybody can miss it. And beside this, what is this? This knowledge 
of the transcendent God becoming a man. Besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. So beside what? What is this? Come on. The word this refers to the subject of the preceding verses. And what is the subject of the preceding verses? The knowledge that the Lord Jesus Christ is the one true God manifesting himself as a human being. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Add to what? You can only add to something which has already been established. And Peter has established faith. You cannot add to what has not already been. So what has already been established in 2 Peter 1, 1 through 4? This. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. So I tell you plainly, this is faith. Faith is this. And besides this, add to this. Add to your faith. 2 Peter 1.5 gives us the Bible's definition of faith. It's the knowledge of the deity and the humanity of Jesus Christ. I give you this definition. Faith is your personal, intimate knowledge of the person, identity, and plan of God that enables you to discern what he intends to do so that you can act in harmony with him. You there? That's what faith is. You're knowing that the everlasting, almighty, transcendent God, the unreachable, the unknowable, defined himself and became a human being to reveal himself to us and to save us. And faith is the foundation you have to add to. It is the fertility because without it, you cannot please him. You can't come to him without believing that he is who, what, where, when, why, how, and how much he is. And that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, just a few more minutes. I want to talk to you about faith and believing. Faith is the knowledge. What is believing? James 2.21 says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou then how faith wrought with his works? And by faith, by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Uh, what a fabulous example. Believing God is defined in this passage as faith, knowing God, and works, obeying what he says to do, knowing God and obeying his word. Faith plus works equals believing God. Believing God is faith active. It's faith as the verb, and it results in salvation or righteousness being imputed to you. God deciding, well, that's going to make you righteous. A faith inactive, faith without works, faith inactive is dead, being alone. <clears throat> that means you can know this truth and be lost. You have to know and obey. We must add to our faith. It's not an option. It's a necessity. But 
we must add to our faith in a specific order. It's not a haphazard thing. And it is important to you and important to me that we take heed how we build on the foundation. Things must be done the way God says. And that's where we're going to end this morning's lesson at only 50 minutes long. What a what a marvel of the blessing of God. Next session that we do in this series, next Sunday morning, Lord willing, we will get into the spiritual cycle of life and we'll show you each of the spiritual principles that are the way we are to model our spiritual life, the way we're to build it. And uh, we will save that for next week. I pray God's blessing on you. I want to thank you for joining me in this session in the watch party or watching it on YouTube, Facebook or YouTube, uh, or by the audio podcast. And I hope that you are enjoying them and that they are being a blessing to you in this time of social distancing. I'm looking so much forward to being with you face to face and to being able to give you a hug and let you know how much I love you and I miss you. So if you bow your heads for me. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you give me this opportunity and the people the opportunity to hear successive parts of this study as we are bringing the Foundations of Life Bible Study series to its conclusion in the next months. We thank you for allowing us to receive the, the word of the Lord in this fashion, in this way. And we thank you for making it revelatory to us, for getting past a mere hope so or believe so or think so, all the way down to the no so. We do not want to be a people, Lord, who believe a lie who believe that falsehood is true or that error is correct. Thank you for revealing yourself to us, Lord. We want to build appropriately, step by step, to become your people. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you. See you tonight, I hope.